Well, hello, YouTubers, and we have another video beginning C part 23. This time we're going to be covering unit testing. What is unit testing? Well, so when you write code, you want to test it and you want to test it at that level, at that unit level. You want to make sure that your functions do what they're supposed to do and functions can return different types of values. So you have to have several different test cases and your test cases will outline how your function is supposed to work. So if you have to return a value, you don't just test one case, you test all the different cases that your uh, function should handle. So let's get started. So for this unit testing, uh, I chosen to uh, demonstrate uh, its permutation of. So let's say we have a function and we have its permutation of and we have the function and we say int is permutation of and we have a string as one and we have another string And if S1 is a permutation of S2, then we can return true and we can then otherwise we return false. So to do that, we have a define, we have our constants. So we define what true is, true will be one. And false will be zero. So, <clears throat> Now we have that and let's just go ahead and return false. It doesn't do anything at this point. So we return false. So now, uh, what is a permutation? So let's, a permutation, a permutation is when you have a set of numbers and it's not really a set because you can have duplicate values in there. Uh, typically with the set you don't have uh, uh, you don't necessarily have uh, uh, unique values with the set you typically have unique values but in this case we can have any values and we want to see if it's a permutation in other words if it's rearranged if something is rearranged a certain way so for example we have a permutation of two numbers one and two or two characters we can rearrange it in factorial terms. So factorial, that would be two factorial, which means you have two ways of assigning this because two factorial is two times one, which is equal to two. So you can arrange it as one and two, and you can arrange it as two and one. What if you had three? Well, if you had three, you have one and two and three and this time it would be three factorial because you have three elements and it would be three times two times one. So what you have is three times two times one, which is six. Well, so you would have one, two, and three, and you can arrange it as one and three and two, one and three and two, and then you could arrange it then as two and one and three and as two and three and one and then you can arrange it as and let's let's do this because this is hard to read so you have one two three one three two two one three sounds like i'm calling out area codes uh, so if we have two and three and one, and then we can have three and one and two. And finally, we can have three and two and one. And there's our six. So there's one and two, three, four, five, and six. Well, what if you have four this time? One, two, three, and four. 
So that that permutation would be four factorial, which is four times three times two. And we won't say one because we know what that is. In this case, if you multiply four times three, you get 12 times two. You now you got 24 permutations that you can have. And if you get into five and five times four is, you know, 20 uh, times three is 60 times two is 120. So you can see where this is going now that you get a lot of permutations, but there's an easier way. And this, I hope you get the idea now with uh, permutations. So if we have S1, for example, and we have S1 and S2, so if we're given the value, for example, if we have one, two, and three, is that a permutation of three and two and one? And the answer is yes, it is. It is a permutation of three and two and one because we have the same numbers. So how would you go about doing that? Well, we don't know the answer yet, and I will get to the answer, but before we do that, let's write a test function that can test all of this. So a simple test function, and I'm going to go ahead and cheat, and I'm going to create a test function, and I grab it, and I promise I will show it to you, but let me go ahead and just grab my test function out of here. And let's go ahead and paste it here. And of course, I didn't copy the whole thing. So this is my test function. And this test function, I pass it expected value and actual value. So this is what I expect to return. So for example, if I expect, uh, if I expect my function to return true, I pass it true or one, and then my actual is what my function returns, and then I give it a name. So if my expected and actual are equal, so if they're equal, my test passes, and I just simply print test, whatever the test name is, and pass. And if it fails, otherwise if they're not true, that means it failed, and I just simply write my test name. Failed, and I tell it what I expected and what it was. And that's a simple test. It's a simple way to create your unit test. So with that said, let's uh, figure out the algorithm for uh, is permutation of. One of the first things we want to do with uh, testing the permutation is we would want to take and say, okay, there's a couple of cases. We know that if we have an empty string, right? If we have an empty string, then we would fail, right? We would return false, not fail, but return false because you can't have a permutation without with an empty string, either here or here right and also if the lengths are not the same if we have one two three and three two and it's missing well we automatically know that it's not a valid permutation so we just say false for that and then it goes deeper than that so one way of solving this problem would be to simply sort our values sort the first value for example if we had two three one and we have two, one, three. Well, we can't compare these, these values as they are because they're going to be different because these are the same, but then the middles are different and the ends are different. And we don't wanna create a whole bunch of permutations and compare them. So the easiest way to do this would be to simply sort these. So we can sort our one, two, three. We say one, two, three, sort that one and we sort this one, one, two, three. And once we have them sorted, then we can compare them. So let's write our test before we do that. So let's come up with some test cases. So a simple way to be to test this would be to say, test, and let me make some room here so you can see what I'm doing. So a simple way to do this would be to say test, call our test function and say test, and we expect it to be true for um, its permutation of, and we would pass it, uh, let's say, let's take A and A, and we know that is a valid permutation, so we expect it to be true, 
and then we give it a test name. We just say A. When we run this, it failed. It expected one, but was zero because we haven't implemented. Everything returns false. What else would be a valid permutation? So let's take another case and copy this. So we copy it and we say another permutation would be ABC and ABC, and we call this test ABC. And we run it, and of course, it's going to fail also. Let's take another test. Control C. Oh, Control C. And let's go ahead and copy this test over. And let's say ABC and BAC. Oh, I have a sticky mouse. I really need to do something about this sticky mouse situation. And so we say key cab and BAC and that should return. And this time we, we show both values. So we say cab and BAC and we run it. And you can see our test A failed, our test ABC failed, expected one, cab and back failed. So we have a whole bunch of failing tests. And so we wanna do that. And let's test our other case. Let's go ahead and write a test for this and its permutation of, and let's say for example that we have another permutation where the characters are different, just single characters, C and B, and we say C and B. And this time we need to say false. And of course you can, you get the idea now that when I run it, this one amazingly passes, so it's like, oh, we have a passing test. But we haven't implemented anything and because it returns false for everything. Everything that's expected to be false passes. So, okay, it passes. Code works. So if it was running in production and it passed, well, yeah, okay, it, that worked, perfect. But of course, the true cases don't pass. So let's write some more test cases. Let's take something like this and say, Say, for example, another true one would be to take something longer. Let's take A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And let's write it in reverse order. G, F, E, D, C, B, A. So let's say A, B, C, D, E, F, G backwards. So this, this test, we call it our A, B, C, D, E, F, G test. And of course, if we run it, you can see that it still, it fails. Okay, so we have a failing test there. Let's take our other case where we have one value is empty and the other one is not A, A, A B, C. And we call it is one is empty. And let's take that and also do another test and say A, B, C, and the other value is an empty string. And two is empty. And let's take another test. And, and in these cases, I didn't even correct this, but this should return false. Well, we expect to return false in that case. And this test, we expect it to be false as well. In this case, we expect it to be false, but we have to adjust our test. And we say, okay, oh, wait a minute. Okay, they're both empty. In this case, it's both one and two are empty. One and two are empty. So we say, okay, one and two are empty. So we have our cases there. We have AA, ABC. We've done a pretty good job so far where we have that. What if we have something that has different lengths? So we have this, control C it. And we have A, B, C, and A, B. And we have A, B, C, and A, B. We have that test. 
So I think we have plenty of tests to test our, if if everything works, right? We can test it with numbers too. So let's say for example, we have, uh, let's see, some numbers. And we expect this test to be true. And we're gonna do it with numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? And let's take it in reverse order. Nine, eight, seven, six, five. Four, three, two, right? Uh, so let's just take and call this test one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We'll just call it that. Oh, sorry. Uh, so there you have A, B, C, and A, B, and the test one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I forgot the one here. And so this should return true. And we have all our cases. So I think we have plenty of cases, and of course, if we run them right now, uh, they all fail. All our tests failed, okay? And one way to do it, because this looks kind of already, we're seeing something kind of weird. So we may want to separate our failed, and we may actually want to say pass here instead. Pass, and we give it the test name, and for fail, we say failed because that looks kind of ugly. And we say, ooh, we say failed, and we get rid of failed. We get rid of all of this. Uh, let's copy this before we do that. And what I want to do is I want to get rid of the actual and the expected here and just leave the test name. And let me get rid of the actual. I just want to show off that it failed and I want to do this. And I can say expected here, just indent it a little bit. And let's get rid of test name because we already have the test name on the line above. So let's run it again. And it looks a little bit cleaner. And ABC failed, failed. Why do we have failed twice? We don't want failed twice. Let's run it again. And now we have, okay, we can see everything failed A, failed ABC, failed L, all these failed. Some pass because, of course, everything that's true is going to pass, is empty. Um, so we have to implement this. So one of the first things we want to do is we want to uh, create a sort function. So we want to. Uh, create the sort function and I'm going to cheat a little bit from code that I previously wrote and What I want is to have a sort function because The first thing we want to do of course we have the two cases where we have length equals zero Return false length if the lengths are not equal we return that so let's go ahead and copy this code over We'll start off with that So we say, and you may be wondering what I'm doing here why I'm creating a separate pointer and I will get into that. But before we do that, the first case is, okay, if the strength length of one is zero or string length of S2 is zero, well, they're false because you can't have a permutation with an empty value, empty set. So that's not a valid permutation, obviously. And then uh, if the lengths are different for S1, is the, for example, if you have ABC and AB, well, that's not a valid permutation either, so you return false, and you have that. So at this point, we can run, and so we have um, these same failures and everything, so. So let's go ahead and then uh, in order to for us to do that, we need to sort S1 and S2. But since these are const care, we can't touch these guys. We cannot um, sort these guys in place. So we need something else to sort them. And so for us to sort them, we need to uh, have some other arrays, but we can't determine the arrays 
we can't hard code the values because if we hard code the values, it would put a limitation on how long these can be. For example, if I say char and I create an array of 100, then that means I can't test anything greater than 100. But what if I want to test uh, strings that are, you know, 500 characters or 255, then that changes everything. So the best way to do that is through dynamic memory allocation. So let's do that. So let's take that and take dynamic memory allocation. And the way you do that is using malloc. So we do the memory allocation here. And let's indent that properly. So what we're doing here is we're allocating the memory and we're saying the size of the first element, which is char. So we're saying whatever, however big char is, how many bytes it is, times the length, right, is how much memory we have to allocate. One thing that I don't have here is the, the fact that you need a length greater than that because you have to allow space for the null character. So let's go ahead and do that. And if you remember from your math operations, the multiplication is done first. So it would multiply times that and add one. We don't want that because we want to multiply it times the number of bytes. Now, in this case, it'd probably be okay because I think char is only one byte. But in the case of it was an int and it's four bytes, then you would have a problem because you're not allocating the right amount of memory. So what we need to do is we want the addition to happen first and then multiply times that. So if our length is 10, 10 plus one, 11, and then multiply this times 11. So if it was an end, it would be four times, you know, 11, which would be 44. Otherwise we would get something like, you know, multiplication of this, which would be four times 10 would be 40 plus one would be 41. You're missing three bytes there. So you don't want to do that. So let's do that to this one and let's do that to this one. So there we have the allocation of memory. Now that we have that, we can copy the values into from S1 and S2 into these, and we can do that through string copy. So let me cheat a little bit and just use this. So one of the things that you also have to do with uh, when you allocate memory is check that you actually receive memory. Your program may not necessarily allocate the memory. So you want to check for null. And null is defined in the standard library. So if I get null pointers, we return undefined and we haven't defined undefined. So let's go ahead and define that. On def and we'll just make a negative one. So if we don't get the right amount of memory, we return undefined, right? So so we return that and now once we do that, we want to copy the values we want to copy those values into uh, S1 and S2 and we're using string copy out of the string library and what happens is this gets copied into this since we have the memory allocated, we can copy the value from S1 into this, into PS1 and S2 into PS2. So now that we have that copied over, uh, there's uh, another thing that we must do, and that is to sort these. So we want to sort the values of S1 and S2. So we want to sort them. And where does this sort function come from? Well, we haven't created it yet. We don't have a sort function, but if you remember from the past when we were doing a past tutorial and we did the grade, we sorted the grade. So we have a sort function and I will cheat a little bit once again, and I already have a sort function. So let me copy this sort function over. And let's copy the sort function right in here. And this is just a simple bubble sort, and it's a very brute force approach. It's not the best sort by any means, but uh, for this purpose, it works fine. So the way it works is we pass the array, the target, we get the length, because we have to know the length in order to perform the bubble sort. We have a variable for swapped and a temporary value, and we do it in a while loop. 
and we say while swap not equal zero because we're initializing swap to zero on every iteration. So then when we do our for loop, we are going to look for anything that's out of sequence. For example, if you have one, two, five, and three, and then you have six and seven, when it goes through this loop, it's going to perform a swap. Let's not get into the algorithm for the swap yet. But if it gets in here and it finds these out of sequence, it's going to swap these two values. So it'll be one, two, three, four, and five. Swap is called and it gets set to one. So this thing says, hey, it's not equal to zero, go again. The second time around, what it's gonna find, it's going to find one, two, three, five, six, and seven. So it's not gonna find anything to swap the, the next time around, it goes through the entire array and it's not gonna find anything swapped, so this never gets set to one, so it's zero and it jumps out of the loop. Simply at that point, we return the target. Now, the way the, the swap works is we go from i, zero, the element zero in the array, to length minus one. Now, we, we don't go to length minus one, we're actually going just a little bit before, because remember, it's zero base, zero, one, two, three, four, five. So even though this is six elements, the length is six, we go from zero, one, two, three, four, five, but the length is six, six minus one, and it has to be less minus one, so it only goes up to this element. And so when we compare, the reason we don't go all the way to the end is because when it comes time for the swap on the last element, we wanna check this element against this element. So this is element, element five against element six. So we should compare element five against six. So as we go through the loop, we compare one against two or zero against one, one against two. If we find that they're out of sequence because we say element one has a lesser value, so if it has a greater value than the element after it, we go ahead and swap them. The way you perform a swap is by taking and holding the element in, for example, here, you hold it in a temporary value. So if you have if you were swapping, in this case, when we were swapping five and three, we take five and put it in a temporary value. We take the element at here and we're gonna override it with what's in with what's in the next element. So we put three in there. So now this one holds three and this one's still holding uh, three, but we overwrite, we then take and overwrite um, uh, the that element, the next element, right, the one that's holding three, we hold it with a temporary value, which was five, and we put five in there. So we're just doing a swap. All we're doing is swapping numbers here. All it is swap. And we set our swap to one. So once that swap completes, it goes through. If there was more numbers out of sequence, it would just keep going until there's no more swaps, and it finishes the sort, and it sorts out. So at that point, now we have a sort. So one easy way to test our sort, we probably just want to do a, a sort sequence and we can test it easily by doing something like this. So we have a array of characters and we have my word or something and we have five and we say equals CAB and we say printf and we say percent %s, and we say sort my word, it should give us ABC. And the reason that I'm creating an array and not just passing a literal is because, remember, if I'm not defining cons here, which means I'm modifying the, uh, the array in place, so, when you pass a literal, you don't want to touch it and you can get some really unexpected results. So you don't want to do that. So at this point, we're going to just go ahead and swap those values. And so we sort it and let's see if our sort works. Sorted ABC. Okay, so it does sort, okay? So it sorts cab sorted to ABC. So we know our sort works. So what do we have here? It's permutation of. So it's still, our tests are still failing as, okay, well, why are they failing? Well, because we haven't taken the time to compare our strings. So we know that 
if they're different length, if either one of them is an empty string, return false. If the string lengths are not, then return false. But now we get into copy and sort. And the only thing we have to do here at this point is compare PS1 and PS2. So we say if PS1, oh, actually, we say if string compare, and this is part of the string library, which is up here. Ooh, I don't have the string library, so I do need the string library. So we say include string.h because that's where our string copy and our string compare are stored. And then we also include the standard library because that's where mayloc is stored. And I'm surprised my code is even working because it shouldn't. Okay, so now we have that. And so now that we have that, uh, we have sort and now we compare and we compare PS1, right? and we compare it to PS2. And remember that string compare works. It returns zero if they're equal. And if PS1 is greater than PS2, it returns greater than zero. It returns one, but it could return something else. So we just compare it greater than zero, but we're not interested in that. We just wanna see if they're equal. If they're equal, we return true. Otherwise, it's just gonna fall out and return false. But there's one more thing that we have to do. So let's just, let's just run this for now and let's see what happens. So let's go ahead and run it and all our tests pass. And that's the algorithm. Now, there's one thing, we talked about mayloc. So we have mayloc here and we dynamically grab memory and we have pointers pointing to that memory. And if we don't release the memory, when we come out of this function, there's going to be a memory leak. Uh, memory leaks are uh, can be problematic in your program if you have a program that runs for a long time or it does a lot of processing and it, this gets called a lot of times. Every time it would go in here and it does a mayloc, it would allocate the, for instance, in this case, it allocated A and AB and all that. Well, if it gets to this point, if it returns before that, it doesn't. But anytime that the strings are actually equal, it will allocate that memory and so in this case, it, it gets all those bytes and it doesn't release them. Like in this case, it didn't release them. If you run this thousands of times or hundreds of thousands of times, you can imagine it's going to leak out memory. It's not being released. The program's not gonna release it. Uh, eventually your program will crash. Uh, in small programs like this, that's not that important. But if you have, for example, something like a web server application or even a web application that's leaking memory, and when it gets to a certain point, it's just gonna crash and it becomes unresponsive and people can't access it and it freezes up and it stops responding and it, there's nothing it can do. So just keep that in mind. So what do you do to release the memory back? Well, very simple. So what you do is you just call the free function, which is in the string in the standard library. So you just free the memory by calling P free PS1, free, PS2, and that's when it's true, it's gonna free it. But what about when it's false? Well, I'm not releasing it here, so I have to also release it here. One way to get around that would have been if I just store the value and say, and then just free it in one place, which would probably be better if I just have the result value and then just free it in one place, but this will work either way. So let's say free PS1 and free PS2. And now we free the memory. So that's one thing that you have to do when you do mayloc, make sure you free your memory, run it, it still works. So there you are, it passes the test. You can write more tests if you can think of other tests that where it would fail or sometimes you may get into code where sometimes down the road there's something that you didn't account for in your test and you have to go back, write a test for it, and it passes, and then you're good to go. So there it is, that's how you unit test, uh, something not terribly hard to do. Uh, permutation uh, might take you, you know, it, to think of how to solve the problem might have took you a little while, but as you can see, it's not really that difficult. Uh, so there you are, and I will post the code um, on the description of this video, so if you're interested in seeing the code at work, uh, just uh, go ahead and uh, 
click on that link and it'll take you to the code you can play around with it if you like this video go ahead and like it if you like the channel go ahead and subscribe i have more videos coming your way and if you have any questions go ahead and ask them in the comments below and i will answer them as best as i can thanks for watching